Ecuador in 2005, and a UN consultant for the process of choosing the Supreme Court of Guatemala in 2009. Moving on to Viviana Krzysztofowicz, who is, she is the executive director of the Center for Justice um, and International Law. She has litigated more than 200 cases before the Inter-American Commission and Court of Human Rights on cases concerning the protection of human rights and the strengthening of the rule of law. She's an um, Argentine-educated lawyer with degrees from Stanford and Harvard. She's developed numerous advocacy and litigation activities throughout the Americas, particularly in the expansion of human rights. And she's an editor and author of various books and articles. John Cerrone, to immediately to my right, is a visiting professor of international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and also holds faculty appointments at AU Washington College of Law and the University of London. He has received prestigious fellowships and awards, too numerous to enumerate now, um, has written widely, and has taught in more than 40 countries including for periods of time at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg, the Raoul Wallenberg Institute in Lund, and the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. He's worked for a number of IGOs and NGOs, has extensive field experience in conflict and post-conflict environments, including Afghanistan, Kosovo, Sierra Leone, and East Timor. Perhaps most relevant for the remarks he'll give today on international criminal law, he was a visiting scholar at the International Criminal Court a legal advisor for the ICTY, ICTR, and Special Court for Sierra Leone. And last year, he held a fellowship at the Nobel Institute in Oslo, where he worked on accountability for the use of chemical we weapons. Please join me in um, thanking um, our speakers for coming this evening. <laughs> So, Professor Ayala, um, you will start us off with a slideshow um, and discussion about the role of the UN and OAS, human rights bodies, um, and the role that they have played in the Venezuela crisis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation, and thank you very much for the presentation you have made about us. And uh, I will begin uh, by saying that when Chavez was elected president in 1999, he promised to deliver a revolution in Venezuela. Uh, his argument was that pe the people was not getting their part of the wealth of the country due to the old corrupt institutions. So he promised to demolish the old regime and to empower the people. For that goal, the 1961 constitution and the rule of law was a serious obstacle. So what was the tool that he used to overcome that obstacle? He called for a constituent assembly, which was uh, approved by a referendum and voted by the people. So the first task became to abolish the old democratic regime through a new constitution that came into effect in December 1999. But this constitution has never been applied. Soon after, a few days after the constitution was put into force, uh, in December 1999, the Constitutional Assembly, without following the constitutional requirements and procedures, elected and filled all the new branches of the state with party loyalists, the Supreme Court, the Electoral Council, the Attorney General Prosecutor, the Comptroller, and the Ombudsperson the office of the ombudsperson. Then the majority of the judges became provisional judges, that is to say uh, judges subject to free appointment and free dismissal without any due process, without any cost, and without the right to appeal. From then on, the judiciary, and especially the Supreme Court through the, what is called the Constitutional Chamber, a sort of constitutional court, was going to be, in the case of Venezuela, the tool used to consolidate the revolution and to hijack the written constitution. So the judiciary was put at the service of the revolution and its party, the PSUV, Partido Socialista Unido de Venezuela. The general critic in the country and around the world was that this was a clear violation, not only of the new constitution 
and international standards, but general principles of the rule of law, including separation of powers and independence of the judiciary. The, the response to that from Chavez and the government is that these are, and these were, bourgeois principles, which do not apply to the new revolutionary age, the new revolutionary regime. So a new era of populist welfare had begun at, began at that time under a charismatic military leader with a confiscation of over 1,500 private enterprises of all kinds, the closing of the major independent TV broadcasting channel, RCTV, and dozens of independent radios and newspapers, etc. None of these decisions could be challenged not reverse before the domestic courts. Social benefits called misiones began to be delivered to the poor people in an ineffective and corrupt manner, but subject to the political loyalty as in the case of the nowadays club or food boxes, which require the registrations, the registration of citizens with a motherland ID. This old situation led to the erosion of the rule of law, which at the time led to the erosion of human rights and democracy. When the opposition won two thirds of the seats in the 2015 legislative election, it was the Supreme Court which was used as a tool to hijack the will of the people, the constitution and the separation and the independence of powers, emptying all the constitutional powers of the new National Assembly, the right to the recall referendum of President Maduro, and delaying state and municipal elections until, until President Maduro, in an unconstitutional manner, convened by decree a new constitutional assembly not elected by universal suffrage. Once installed, this assembly declared itself above all branches of government, and more important, it has declared itself in the record and in the status above the Constitution. So from now on, the Constitution will be modified and the Constitution will be what this Constituent Assembly will decide. It has kidnapped the powers of the National Assembly, is issuing laws, all type of administrative acts of control and authorization to the executive. It has called for elections without any guarantee as the one which took place on May 20th this year advancing the presidential elections by not holding free and fair elections. Opposition parties were illegalized, the major opposition candidates were disqualified, and a one-party control electoral council run the elections. These elections results were not recognized by the European Union countries and the majority of the governments of the OES. So Venezuela is a clear lesson which was written on the wall of how without rule of law you cannot have democracy nor enjoyment and protection of human rights and how without the rule of law you can also have you cannot also have a welfare social state venezuela nowadays is a tragedy of political persecution of all kinds of dissidents including journalists students union leaders political leaders arbitrary detention, street crime, police and military abuses, especially in the repression of protests, also malnutrition, hunger, lack of medical services and medicines across the population, but always hitting the most vulnerable. So what I'm going to show you now is with this evolution of the situation of Venezuela through the hijacking of the constitutional powers, through the hijacking of the separation of power, what was the reaction of the international organs of human rights, briefly, both at the OES level and at the um, universal level, UN level. So bearing, into, bearing in mind what I have just said about the importance of having human rights across with the rule of law and democracy, as the Inter-American Court has asserted several times, and as um, the preamble of the American Convention state for, and the Inter-American Democratic Charter 
and recently a resolution adopted by the Human Rights Council in Geneva last year. In the case of Venezuela, I identify the erosion and the kidnap or hijack of the judiciary as a tool to reinterpret the whole system. So beginning with the inter-American system, you, you, you know that the system worked through this method, cases, country reports, country visits, thematic report, and press releases. We began to see that most of the cases were referred to violations to the right to a fair trial and judicial protection, independence of judges, excessive use of force, freedom of speech, arbitrary detentions, extrajudicial institutions, and political rights. As we are going to see, the administrative disqualification of candidates, uh, the use of uh, the judiciary to disqualify other candidates or, or to put them in prison was or is being examined through these case studies. Uh, so with the number of cases that have been processed uh, through the uh, commission and the court, you can see that it is a, is a fairly good amount, bearing in mind the limited resources of the commission and the court that have been processed during these last 18 years. Um, you see the cases of regarding the decisions of admissibility, precautionary measures that has, have been uh, issued by the Commission, which is an important tool, especially bearing in mind that Venezuela denounced the American Convention, so the court uh, somehow stopped its jurisdiction for future cases or situations. So you see that 14 of the precautionary measures were about persons at risk because of their political activities. Uh, other 14 are journalists or other related persons regarding to the freedom of expression. Then few more regarding life. Um, human rights offenders have been specially targeted. Um, arbitrary detentions. There is a problem with the provisional measures regarding arbitrary detentions. You know that the inter-American system only grants precautionary measures regarding the conditions of detentions, mainly. Uh, but you'll see that most of the Venezuelan ca cases have resorted to the UN system where the group, uh, the working group on arbitrary detention can take the cases through a sort of uh, international habeas corpus. Uh, 19 cases with 22 judgments, again, referred to, for instance, three cases are regarding um, this arbitrary dismissal of judges uh, without any cause, without any due process, without any right to appeal. So the, the jurisprudence of the court is, was enriched uh, through these cases uh, of judicial independence in Venezuela. Political rights, um, I'd like to mention especially the case of Leopoldo Lopez, disqualified by the controller by an administrative act. Cases regarding freedom of expression, journalists, or the shutdown of RCTV. So you see that these themes, which are basic to the play of democracy and rule of law, were at stake uh, in all of these decisions, as well as in the provisional measures being issued by, um, by the court. Bear in mind that in the last 18 years, Venezuela has been included in the chapter four of the uh, of 14 annual reports. Chapter four of the annual report of the Inter-American Commission is, uh, according to several standards set up along the years, problems, country problems or countries that need a special attention uh, due to certain uh, circumstances. So Venezuela has been in 14 opportunities, and there have been three separate country reports. And you see from the very beginning in 2003 how the erosion of the rule of law was being analyzed from the very beginning by the Inter-American Commission regarding the role that was being played by the Supreme Court 
and the lack of separation of powers. And, and, and the last uh, report of last year is a very comprehensive analysis of what the situation of human rights and the rule of law is in Venezuela. The commission was only allowed to pay one official visit back in 2002, uh, but what we call academic visits have taken place. One of a former uh, executive secretary of the commission and one by the special rapporteur for freedom of expression. But mainly we invited them by the university so they come and deliver a speech and have not secret but not politicized uh, meetings where we, with academia and civil society, but sometimes they can meet a government official, but they're not recognized as official visitors. Also, I don't have enough time, but Venezuela has been mentioned during the reports of these last years, uh, the thematic report in civil areas, uh, especially regarding persons deprived of liberty. You know that in Venezuela, every year there are more persons killed in the Venezuelan prisons than in the rest of the Americas. Manfred Novak said in 2008 that more people die in the Venezuelan prisons than in the rest of the world. Don't, I'm quoting the rapporteur for against torture at the time. You know, 122 press releases is a very active way through which the commission has been working in Venezuela and especially in the field of freedom of expression. Well, the bad news is that Venezuela has not complied neither with the decisions of the commission nor with the decisions of the court. Even more, uh, the court went on in an unusual, uh, unprecedented manner to quote and invoke Article 65 of the American Convention reporting to the General Assembly in a special manner that Venezuela was structurally not complying with the decisions. You know that the decisions issued by the court are brought, are brought before the Supreme Court in Venezuela, and the Supreme Court decides that it's not applicable in Venezuela, that decision, because it does not comply with the Constitution. So this is part of the reason why the court decided to uh, bring this to the attention of the um, OES political bodies. Uh, furthermore, Venezuela went on and denounced the American Convention in 2012. The sad part of the story is that there was no collective reaction on the, on the side of, of the OES body. Neither the Permanent Council nor the General Assembly said anything about that. I thought the General Secretary will come here to speak about his initiatives regarding the, the, the collective defense of democracy, but for reasons of time, I'll skip this and just mention briefly that Venezuela has been also the focus of attention at the universal uh, human rights system, the UN. The Human Rights Committee has dealt uh, with five cases, mainly dealing uh, with arbitrary detention, right to fair trial, and judicial protection and the risks to which political activists are exposed. The Committee Against Torture has dealt with one case, which you wouldn't believe it, but it's a fourth disappearance inside a prison. And more important in the case of the UN has been the opinions given by the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. For instance, one of them, is about 460 students who were arbitrarily detained. And this group has advanced since two years ago, stating that in the case of Venezuela, there is a clear situation of a systematic, uh, systematic uh, detention of government opponents. And he has even gone further to assert that this systematic uh, violations uh, are part of what may be called crimes against humanity. We, we, we can get into that afterwards. Well, you know, the periodic reports that the country have to present before these bodies have been um, through a 
analysis with the active participation of the civil society and the recommendations made are along the lines that we have been seeing, as well as the universal periodic review regarding all of these rights that have been mentioned. So the question to finish is, after all of this work of the international bodies, after all of these decisions by the court, by the commission, all of this report, after all of these decisions at the UN level, all of these opinions, all of these recommendations, what has been the reaction beyond the cases when you see a more structural problem uh, regarding rule of law and democracy, which is uh, producing this effect in violations of human rights? There has been no major reaction in, on the side of the UN Council regarding Venezuela, but last year the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights took a major step also without precedent. He, by himself, issued a report on the violations and abuses in the context of protests that took place in Venezuela in April last year. Uh, he is doing, because he, I know this because he has announced it publicly, that in the coming days he will be issuing a follow-up report on this. And the other thing that happened just recently, February this year, is that the office of the ICC, International Criminal Court Prosecutor's Office, has announced, and someone else will speak about this in this panel, the opening of the preliminary examination regarding the situation in Venezuela. Question at the end is, meanwhile, as we're sitting here, the situation is being deeply aggravated in Venezuela. So the question can be how the human rights protection bodies at the OES level and at the UN level can help alerting this situation and through a collective response can these problems can be addressed. This is more, in my opinion, for the political bodies of the OES and the UN and there is a question on where are we in the collective protection of human rights, not only by the same country, but by the rest of the countries uh, that are part to a treaty or convention. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, certainly raises lots of questions um, that we'll look forward to discussing after the other two panelists. Uh, Viviana, I believe you will talk about the impact of the humanitarian and human rights crisis in Venezuela on forced migration, um, the need for comprehensive solutions that address the causes and consequences of the break breakdown of democracy. Um, perhaps you'll also address some of the uh, health crises that have emerged from um, the uh, displacement. Look for Viviana. Um, thank you very much, um, Sandra, and I would need somebody to help me maneuver this. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't think it's working. But in the meantime, I just wanted to say that I'm very glad to be here. Uh, thank you for joining us at this panel, and, and thanks to ASOL and the American University Academy on Human Rights for convening such a timely panel. Um, Sehil has not only been following the human rights situation in Venezuela um, for the last 27 years, but we were actually founded in Venezuela, in Caracas, uh, by a group of human rights defenders from across the Americas that wanted to, to use international law to change the unjust realities of the region. Our mandate uh, has been to work on behalf of human rights victims on issues of violence, equality, the rule of law and democracy using the tools of international law and the inter-American system. And our aim is to ensure redress for victims but also a more democratic, peaceful continent for all. Now, the incremental erosion of Venezuelan democracy that was so well described by Carlos Ayala, the breach of democratic checks and balances and the guarantees of social and political participation, the systematic violations of human rights, and the severe economic crisis have led to an unprecedented 
and complex humanitarian crisis in the country that also has reverberations throughout the region. This crisis has manifested itself in food shortages, inflation reaching rates of 2,600% in 2017, a, a dysfunctional healthcare system, high levels of violence, the untimely losses of life, and scores of people forced into migration. As it is foreseeable, uh, the lack of food, medicines, and, and health services has had a disparate impact on women, children, and persons with chronic diseases. So here you have some concrete indicators of the humanitarian crisis that Venezuela is going through. Maternal mortality rates have increased significantly, and, and those that, that have been studying maternal mortality or the right to health know that these are preventable deaths. Since uh, 2009, when you had 60 deaths, over 100,000 live births, the number has doubled. Um, now we have estimates of 112 to 130 deaths over uh, 100,000 live births. The increase in infant mortality in some regions have, has reached on 30%. Um, there's a scarcity of dialysis services, cancer medicines, retrovirals that affects people with chronic or terminal diseases, and so that also leads to loss of life. The spread of preventable diseases, even some that were eradicated already in Venezuela, and probably Carlos can tell us more about that, but malaria, diphtheria, measles. There's uh, a reported average loss of 11 kilograms of 60% of Venezuelans in 2017. Uh, the Lancet, which is a, a, a renowned uh, medical journal has reported in 2016 hospitals without drinkable water, close emergency services. A recent report by Amnesty has reported as well severe shortages of 90, 80 to 90% of, of medicines as well as uh, hospitals with severe shortages of surgical materials and beds. That also leads to loss and unnecessarily loss, unnecessary untimely losses of life. Uh, the human faces of these indicators are hunger, hardship, lives lost, and the hundreds of thousands that have been forced into uh, migration, forced to leave the country. So today I will focus on one critical aspect of that humanitarian crisis, which is forced migration and its impact throughout the region. Over the last uh, years, between one and two million Venezuelans have actually left the country. This is undoubtedly very substantial in a country that has 31 million inhabitants. It's like two million in 31. Um, only in the period of 2014 to 2018, Venezuelans accounted for 170,000 asylum seekers, and over half a million Venezuelans resettled with an alternative legal status in different countries, primarily in the Americas. As, as reported by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And I'm going to talk a bit more about these uh, countries of destinations and burden sharing in a short while. I just want to stress that issues of forced migration need to be analyzed with a human rights lens. And, and this is why I think it's important that I was preceded by, by Carlos Ayala because you need to see that the causes of forced migrations are linked to democratic deficits. The, that those include high levels of preventable violence and impunity, systematic discrimination or persecution, limitations to freedom of expression and political participation, and the failings in the protections of the right to health, education, et cetera. The need to analyze um, this, the response of these migration flows also with a human rights lens pushes us to, to look at structural and regional approaches that pairs the guarantees of rights with uh, considerations of solidarity, shared responsibilities, and the common purpose of collective guarantees of rights through political mechanisms. Um, many of the Venezuelans that are leaving the country 
are, are eligible for international protection according to the UNHCR and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, this is a slide on, on the numbers of, of asylum seekers from Venezuela from 2014 to 2018 that I've mentioned before. These are some of the main countries of destinations of Venezuelan as asylum seekers. Where are they going and under what conditions? Um, I want to say that most Venezuelans are, are leaving the country um, and are arriving to, to places that where they are not necessarily afforded asylee status. Most of the Venezuelans that are leaving remain either undocumented or acquire a variety of temporary and uh, or permanent resident permits in different countries and that uh, has an impact in the guarantee of their, their rights or the lack of, of, of guarantee of their rights actually. Um, the country that has uh, received the biggest outflow of Venezuelans is undoubtedly Colombia. Uh, many Venezuelans who arrive in Colombia have family ties, ties and some are Colombians, uh, so they're not Venezuelans. And so there's an outflow of Colombians that are returning to Venezuela as well. Uh, according to the International Organization on Migration, the IOM, uh, there are around 600,000 Venezuelans in Colombia. The numbers that are given by the Catholic Church are around a million. Um, other destination countries are are determined by family ties, by economic opportunities, by the possibilities of acquiring a legal residency, by geographic proximity, and, and there's a lot to be said about the different um, waves of, of uh, migrants that have arrived in different conditions to those different countries. But other countries of, of destination are the US with 290,000, Chile, with 119,000, Argentina with 57,000, followed by Peru, Ecuador, Panama, Brazil, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, etc. Um, if you look and, and we wanted to show you, okay, so these are asylum seekers by country. These are people that are resettled with other legal statutes, which is, you, you can see the, the disparate impact, you know, it's, it's much higher, this, this number. And this is the total of Venezuelans by country, and this is, um, here you can see the chart. And we wanted to show this so that you could see the impact that these migration flows have in different countries. So. There are bigger countries that are receiving you know, a disparate number of Venezuelan migrants. So there are smaller countries that are more highly impacted by the outflows of Venezuelans. And um, here you can compare population by total numbers of Venezuelans as reported by the Organization of International Migrations and, and the proportion that that, uh, that leads you to, to see in that specific country. So what's happening with um, asylees or people seeking asylum? Um, in uh, 2014, uh, Venezuelans accounted for around 4,040 uh, of the persons seeking asylum worldwide. And in 2017, that raised to 94,000. That is an increase of 2,000% uh, of Venezuelan asylum seekers. Um, UNHCR foresees that the flow of migrants will increase after the recent elections in, in a significant manner. Right now, UNHCR um, accounts for a, a trickling of 5,000 persons per day at the beginning of the year before the elections. Uh, so what we see and what we're preparing for is massive, um, a, a massive influx of Venezuelan migrants, of a wave of migrants that are, that are less equipped economically and politically that will be um, getting out in, uh, through, through the borders of Venezuela. 
Um, Along with the network of civil society organizations, we've been following the situation, we, as, as you probably might know or you might not know, we've been working on these issues for, for a long time in different contexts, in the Caribbean basin, um, in Central America and in the US. Um, and, and with the, that network of civil society colleagues, we're following very closely what we believe is, is really um, an, an unprecedented uh, humanitarian crisis that has, uh, that requires a, an extraordinary effort to face it. Um, what we have seen with the different organizations that are working on this issue following the situation of, of Venezuelan migrants is that there are important gaps in the data about Venezuelan migrants of who they are and uh, their profiles and needs, their contributions to societies, the numbers and, and the status in which they are in the different countries. Uh, that has an impact obviously on policy and, and the ability to respond to them. There are significant flaws in the legal frameworks and, pra and practices relating to refugees and mig migrants in many countries. Um, we have seen um, lacks, uh, lack of clear procedures to guarantee status in, in many of the countries. Um, we have also uh, presented information uh, before the Inter-American Commission, but you can also see it in the reports of UNHCR. There are some Kafkaesque processes that migrants have to go through to get status in different countries. Sometimes they ask them for birth certificates or for a passport, and, and that's, that's impossible. It's, it's really or is in so significantly delayed is, is uh, it makes it makes it impossible for some of the the migrants to to access health education for children or even to legally cross a border many of them are resorting to to going through um, and, and are pushed to go into a, through alternative ro roads that um, where people are susceptible to be exploited by human trafficking networks and, and criminal groups. Um, so there are also significant problems with the treatment of indigenous um, peoples and and the identification of, of trafficking and um, modern forms of slavery. Um, on a positive note, our region has had a strong international protection framework on issues of migration and, and, and refugees uh, that goes back for decades and have many institutions and organizations with a wealth of knowledge and experience about this. Um, however, this increasing number of, of people that are, um, that are crossing the borders are actually testing the system. Um, though we know that we can build on the lessons that uh, were learned in our region with the Central American refugee crisis, with the Cartagena that led to the adoption of the Cartagena Declaration and, and lately the Plan of Action of Brazil and the San Jose Action Statement and the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants and the different comprehensive frameworks to, to deal with issues of, of migration. Um, and there's a, a lot of wealth of experience as well in civil society and in, um, uh, in, in dealing with some of these issues. All this to say that there needs to be a concerted effort to address the causes and consequences of this humanitarian crisis and of the breach of democracy in Venezuela, and including this critical aspect. Um, I'm uh, sorry that the Secretary General was not able to join us, but I, as I was sure that he would talk about this, I didn't, I didn't prepare for, for talking about uh, some of the, the political roadmap for dealing with the crisis of Venezuela, but for, for the sake of the audience, I will just say that it's necessary to ensure free and fair elections in Venezuela, establish a humanitarian response mechanism with the support of UN agencies and and civil society organizations and a strengthening and a requirement that they respect fundamental rights frameworks and re-engage with international monitoring mechanisms. But to this, that roadmap, that political roadmap, we also have to complement it with a commitment and a, a, a collective response 
to this aspect of the crisis, the migration, the forced migration aspect. And we have to think about considerations of solidarity, burden sharing, and protection of, of rights of migrants. And amongst the, the measures that we believe that are critical in this, in this respect are better information and diagnosis of migration flows. This is something where states have a specific responsibility, but also international organizations working in a complementary uh, manner with um, civil society need to gather, gather better data uh, to understand, further understand the problem and be able to respond to, to this crisis. Some of the, the data is in places that are far from the power centers. They're happening in the borders of Ecuador and in the sea crossing to the Caribbean Basin and in Roraima, Boa Vista. So we need, we need that. Um, we need continued monitoring of, interna of international uh, law um, protection standards. This is critical as well. Um, the international monitoring bodies and domestic um, human rights protection mechanisms have to ensure that these deficits in the protection of the rights of migrants are addressed and that the protection of, of the refugees that are arriving in these countries are addressed. Children are being left out. People are being discriminated against. The, the fair processes are not ensured. Legal assistance is not necessarily provided by, by, um, to ensure the, the determination of status of, of many of these migrants and that some of this, um, this has an impact on the right to education and, um, and, and uh, the precarization or the vulnerability, the increased vulnerability of some of the people that are in those, in those countries. Um, we also need to collectively um, deepen uh, the, the practical consequences of um, shared collective guarantees. Um, and there needs to be a, a deeper political commitment from the OAS and from member states to implement the standards of protection of human rights, including uh, policies and practices to ensure the rights of migrants, to ensure their self-reliance and durable solutions for migrants, which is a critical part of that. And, um, and, and balancing being worried about what happens within the Venezuelan borders, which is critical, and as, as we said before, is, is the cause of this outflow, but we also need to address the, the crisis outside Venezuela, and, or how it's reverberating in the region. And I'm very hopeful and, and um, that that there's so much attention about this issue and that this attention comes before the, the OAS General Assembly because this is a space and this, that should be the this, this space where states recommit to face the different aspects of, of the crisis. And uh, I, I'm always inspired by Elie Wiesel and, uh, and by the learnings of those that have suffered so much and the generosity of those that have given shelter. I think Venezuela has been one of these countries that has been very generous for so many, for so, for so long. And Eli Wiesel um, told us that we, we don't have to be, we have to, to not be indifferent with those facing persecution and injustice and human suffering. I think this is a time where we have to return the favor to Venezuela that has been so uh, open and so welcoming for so many after the Second World War with the dictatorships and, and with, with issues of democratic collapse and gross violations and eco with economic opportunities for so many. So. fascinating to, to learn the over, overview and, as well as the details. You said 5,000 people a day yeah. have been leaving that's, Venezuela. And that's, that's according to UNHCR. That's not our data. It's their data. So, and that was at the beginning of the year. Yeah, we think that now that 
is, is necessarily going to, to um, increase because the UNHCR and other agencies are saying that they expect that in the, la the next year or two years, more than a million people will be leaving Venezuela. And it's frightening. Thank you very much. I do not have a PowerPoint, but I will want to put up some relevant treaty text, just so you, the lawyers in the group have a better understanding of the legal framework for this aspect of the situation. Okay. All right. So I've been asked to address the ICC, the, the international criminal law dimension of the crisis in Venezuela. I just as a caveat should point out that I do not have Venezuela specific expertise. I'm not in any sense an expert on the situation in Venezuela. My expertise is on international criminal law, so I'll mostly be focusing on the legal framework uh, to give everyone a better understanding of what exactly is happening at the International Criminal Court at this point in time and what the options are for going forward. First, um, as you all probably know, earlier this year, the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC announced that they have opened a preliminary examination on the situation in Venezuela. And I say situation because at this phase of ICC proceedings, the ICC is just looking at situations as a whole. They're not yet looking at specific cases. So preliminary examinations are examinations of situations. They are not yet at the, po at the point where they're going to be investigating, and in particular, they're not investigating particular individuals. They're just looking at the situation as a whole. So a preliminary examination is done by the, by the Office of the Prosecutor uh, whenever the prosecutor could potentially proceed with an investigation. It's a threshold requirement before proceeding with an investigation. How does a situation get to the ICC? As you may know, the ICC prosecutor can be triggered either by a referral from a state party, a referral from the Security Council, or the prosecutor on her own initiative can launch an inquiry into a particular situation, and that appears to be what happened here. The prosecutor announced she'll be doing this preliminary examination, and the preliminary examination essentially has uh, several components that are regulated by the ICC statute. It's based on Article 53 of the statute. The ICC prosecutor will do a preliminary examination irrespective of the way in which the situation arrives at the court. So even if the Security Council refers the situation to the court, the prosecutor still does this preliminary investigation. Uh, sorry, preliminary examination. What's the legal threshold that we're looking for? We see in paragraph one, the prosecutor shall uh, da -da -da, initiate an investigation unless he or she determines that there is no reasonable basis to proceed under this statute. So that's the legal threshold, a reasonable basis to proceed. So the preliminary examination is an inquiry as to whether or not this reasonable basis to proceed exists. If the reasonable basis is not there, then the prosecutor is going to decline to open the investigation. So what's the prosecutor considering? First. Paragraph A, the information available provides a reasonable basis to believe that a crime within the jurisdiction of the court has been or is being committed. Secondly, whether or not it's admissible under Article 17. And third, taking into account gravity and interests of victims, whether there are, um, whether there are substantial reasons to believe an investigation would not serve the interests of justice. Okay, so in order to proceed, the prosecutor has to examine all three of these things. First. Is there a crime within the jurisdiction of the court? Is it likely to be admissible? And finally, even if those are fulfilled, is it possible that the interests of justice would not be served by moving to an investigation? So those are possible countervailing interests. First, the question of jurisdiction. Is there jurisdiction to proceed? Here we're talking first about personal or territorial jurisdiction. 
We're also talking about subject matter jurisdiction, whether there appears to have been a crime committed that falls within the subject matter jurisdiction of the court. We're also looking at temporal jurisdiction. Now, uh, Venezuela became a party in 2002. It expressed consent to be bound even prior to that, but the treaty entered into force in 2002. So all of the allegations that have been made in communications to the prosecutor involve conduct post-2002. So there's no problem with temporal jurisdiction. Uh, I should point out, there were communications sent to the prosecutor more than a decade ago about Venezuela, and the prosecutor at that time did a preliminary examination and determined there was not a reasonable basis to proceed at that point in time. The prosecutor did not open an investigation. Part of the reason there was not a reasonable basis to proceed was some of the allegations stemmed from prior to 2002 and therefore were not within the temporal jurisdiction of the court. Today, the allegations are all within the temporal jurisdiction of the court. Another question is um, whether we have personal or territorial jurisdiction. As I said before, Venezuela is a party to the treaty. As you may know, jurisdiction at the ICC is generally based on nationality or territory. So since Venezuela is a party, any crimes allegedly committed by Venezuelan nationals or even by foreign nationals on Venezuelan territory would meet the preconditions for the exercise of jurisdiction. Finally, subject matter jurisdiction. Are, do we appear to have allegations of crimes within the subject matter jurisdiction of the court? As you know, international, the International Criminal Court is dealing with international crimes. We're not talking about problems with the rule of law or democratic deficits here or humanitarian crises even. You have to have criminal, intentional criminal behavior, incompetence, uh, bad governance, any of these things that might lead to a humanitarian crisis are not themselves international crimes. You have to have criminal intent. So if we're talking about ICC jurisdiction, we're looking at war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, or the crime of aggression. These are the four categories of international crimes over which the ICC has subject matter jurisdiction. Let's start with war crimes. Are there any allegations of war crimes? No. Why not? Because you can't have a war crime unless you have a situation of armed conflict. If there's no situation of armed conflict, there's no application of the law of armed conflict, there's no possibility of having a war crime. What about genocide? Do we have the possibility of genocide? There do not appear to be allegations of inhumane acts done with the intent to destroy a particular protected group, protected groups for genocide, racial groups, religious groups, national groups, or ethnic groups. We don't see any indication of genocidal intent, so we're not talking about genocide. Aggression, aggression is wrongful use of armed force between states. Of course, there's no allegation of interstate armed force here, so we're not in the realm of aggression. That leaves us with crimes against humanity. What are crimes against humanity? The definition for crimes against humanity is set forth in Article 7 of the Rome Statute. It's any one of these inhumane acts set forth in Article 7 if they are committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population. So that is the contextual threshold for crimes against humanity. You have to show not only that one, of the, one or more of these inhumane acts have been committed, but they must take place in the context of a widespread or systematic attack directed against a civilian population. It's a very high threshold. The 2006, uh, letter in informing communicants of the, the decision not to proceed with an investigation also referred to this threshold requirement and said the information is clearly insufficient to satisfy this contextual element of a widespread or systematic attack directed against a civilian population. I should also point out here that the definition or the, the phrase attack directed against any civilian population is further refined, and it means a course of conduct involving the multiple commission of acts, so multiple commission of those inhumane acts set forth above, pursuant to or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy to commit such attacks. So this further increases the threshold. So it's not just widespread or systematic acts, inhumane acts, that could comprise this attack against the civilian population, but you also have to have a policy. The attack must be committed pursuant to a policy to rise to the level of crimes against humanity. Now, of course, it doesn't need to be an officially declared policy because, of course, that would rarely happen. Policy can be inferred, but the policy must, in fact, exist. 
So, if anything, we're in the realm of crimes against humanity, but we have to point out here that it is a very high threshold. So is there subject matter jurisdiction? Potentially, if it's determined that there are allegations of crimes against humanity, then perhaps we have a crime within the subject matter jurisdiction of the court. Uh, you may have seen that the expert panel, uh, an OAS appointed expert panel, um, has announced that they they have alleged that crimes against humanity in fact have been committed and so they've issued a press release. I obviously cannot opine on whether I think this is a credible report or not. I have no particular knowledge of the situation there, but their allegations are that crimes against humanity have committed and based on the allegations that underlie that, including some fairly staggering numbers. So among other, other findings, the report identifies 131 murder victims of the 2014 and 2017 protests, identifies 8,292 extrajudicial executions recording, recorded since 2015, identifies more than 12,000 Venezuelans arbitrarily detained, imprisoned, or subject to other severe deprivation, uh, identifies more than 1,300 political prisoners, people that are still detained because of their opposition to the government, so again, I can't say anything about the uh, accuracy of these facts, but again, these allegations might be sufficient to constitute crimes against humanity. And at the preliminary examination phase, that's what the prosecutor is looking for. Is there an allegation, uh, a reasonably credible allegation of a crime against humanity or a crime falling within the subject matter jurisdiction of the court? So if jurisdiction is satisfied, the prosecutor will then look at admissibility. Now, as you may know, the ICC is based on the principle of complementarity, meaning the ICC is supposed to be a court of last resort. So national jurisdictions are given an opportunity to prosecute crimes at the national level. It's only if that doesn't happen, if the national jurisdictions are unwilling to do so or incapable of doing so, that the case becomes admissible before the ICC. So at this stage, the prosecutor is trying to see if there would likely, if any cases that may be entailed by this situation would likely be admissible. So there's a dialogue with the national authorities to see whether and to what extent any of these allegations are being invest investigated. Um, whether any prosecutions have been initiated. Now, the national authorities have tremendous latitude. So you may notice preliminary examinations at the ICC have gone on for decades or more because national authorities are doing something. And what they need to do, I mean, the ICC is there to keep the pressure on, but national authorities can keep these preliminary examinations going for a very long time. The British have been uh, a whiz at this, right? It's been a very long time that the ICC has had this preliminary examination going into the conduct of British troops in Iraq. In addition to this question about complementarity and giving the national system the first chance to investigate and prosecute, there is also an issue of gravity. So as part of this admissibility procedure, the part of the preliminary examination, the prosecutor is foreseeing whether this is sufficiently grave to warrant prosecution by the court. Is it sufficiently grave to be admissible before the ICC? Now, when it comes to war crimes, there's a double-decker gravity issue because the war crime also needs to be particularly grave. In addition to the gravity requirement of Article 17, we saw that in the Comoros referral, for example, where the prosecutor said, declined to open an investigation and said, because there are war crimes allegations, it's a double gravity requirement. In this situation, uh, it's just the gravity requirement of Article 17 if we're talking about crimes against humanity because you don't have that compounded gravity requirement. Okay, um, complementarity uh, as part of admissibility. And finally, if we go back to Article 53, we have this interests of justice criterion. Um, one more point I want to make about gravity is the ICC prosecutor has adopted regulations which flesh out a little bit more what gravity entails. So if we look at Regulation 29 of the Office of the Prosecutor, uh, let's see, we see in Paragraph 2 of Regulation 29, in order to assess gravity, 
The prosecutor considers various factors, including scale, nature, manner of commission, and impact. So as part of that gravity assessment under admissibility, the prosecutor's in particular gonna be looking at these things. What is the scale of the crime? How many victims? How widespread? The nature of the crime? What are the particular inhumane acts that have occurred? And how, how grave are those crimes? Uh, the manner of commission, what weapons are used, what tacti tactics are used in order to carry out the crime, and finally the impact, the impact on victims, to what extent uh, it has impacted victims, their families, rendered people more vulnerable, et cetera. All of that goes into this gravity calculation. Um, all of this is part of the legal framework governing the conduct of the preliminary examination that the prosecutor is currently conducting on the situation in Venezuela. Uh, it's possible that other extraneous factors can also enter into the calculation. As you may be aware, all of the cases before the court right now are in Africa, and the African Union if, has been vocal about its concern that all of the cases before the court have been in Africa. And so um, there is pressure, of course, on the Office of the Prosecutor to bring some sort of regional balance. Now, legally, the prosecutor is not supposed to consider this, and the prosecutor's office says that it will not consider this. But practically speaking, it would make the prosecutor's life a little bit easier if she had some cases outside of Africa. Um, only time will tell, and there is no time limit on the length of a preliminary examination. It can go, go on for a decade or more, uh, which will depend on the extent to which the Venezuelan government cooperates and really how smartly they interact with the ICC. Thank you very much. We now have 20 minutes for questions. I have a few questions to get started, but what I propose then is to take a round of questions from the audience, and I hope that we'll have two rounds of answers, but it may just be one, so, so please be ready with your questions. Um, first question for Carlos. With all of the actions that have been taken, uh, what, is, what, what can change the Venezuelan government. There was recently an opinion piece by Mark Feierstein in the American Quarterly saying that the opposition will need to turn up the pressure internally um, in order to change the dynamics, that the financial support from Russia and China is just um, protects the regime too much. Um, and um, Firestein questions the decision not to contest the elections. Um, I wonder if, if you would comment on that analysis. And I'd be especially interested to hear, um, has Maduro responded to yesterday's report? Um, what has been the response to the ICC prosecutor's opening of the preliminary examination? Viviana, I would love to hear from you. Um, could you tell us about one legal victory um, that Sahil has obtained um, in this area of refugee protection that would be relevant to protecting the Venezuelan refugees? And John, you speculated that it's, it's hard to say how long before um, the ICC prosecutor might move to the next step. Um, but um, given the, the various considerations in politics, um, what's your best guess? Um, so um, I'd like to now turn to the audience. Um, do we have a mic? And will people introduce yourselves as you ask your questions? Hi, I'm uh, Brian McPherson. And for John, uh, the ICC statute, the complementarity, includes uh, being unable to prosecute. Do you have any guess as to whether the, what we've heard about as the lack of independence of the judiciary uh, might uh, make it over that threshold? Okay, this is for Carlos, and it's kind of a follow-up to what we were talking about earlier. 
So the US government narrative about Venezuela is a, you know, sort of criminal government, um, you know, connected to organized crime, drug trafficking, they're all a bunch of drug traffickers. So, you know, to what extent is the narrative of uh, organized crime, massive corruption, uh, et cetera, first of all, true, second of all, helpful? Um, and, you know, sort of where do you go with it? And I think I would actually ask that of John as well, mm -hmm. right? You know, sort of there's been this discussion around a number of different countries about, you know, the, the court has this view of what it's supposed to be doing that's very much about political repression. But what about if what you've got is something that looks more like organized crime, massive corruption, um, you know, uh, combined with, right? Where does the court go with that? Uh, I'm Naomi Rodariasa, University of California, Hastings. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mariano de Alba. I work for the Atlantic Council. So I have three really brief questions. So for, for Carlos, I would ask, in your opinion, you know, the, the lack of international response to Venezuela, especially from 2017 backwards, is it more of a political, the, the, the reason behind it is political, or do you think there is a lack of legal mechanisms uh, within the inter-American system to respond to undemocratic govern, governments and so forth? Uh, to Viviana, I would ask, you, you briefly touch upon the Cartagena Declaration. Uh, there is a legal debate about uh, how ample the definition of migrants uh, is, an, uh, is, is the one provided by the Cartagena Declaration. In your view, does that declaration uh, would legally uh, oblige governments across the region to give a more beneficial treatment to Venezuelan migrants? And finally, to John, I would like to ask one of the allegations that have been made by, by this this panel of three experts appointed by the Secretary General of, General of the OAS is that, you know, besides tor torture and, you know, assassinations and so forth, uh, Venezuela has been leaving a, 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 a real problem on scarcity of food and also of mechanisms by which the government is using food to control the population. Um, one of the members of this panel has argued that you could introduce or you could, you, could, you could make the argument that the use of food to control political, to control the, the population in a political manner could be uh, inserted into, uh, into a crime, into Article 7, Crimes Against Humanity, specifically under, I, th I think it's the last, the last subset which says other inhumane acts. Do you agree with that view? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Schoquist, a former student of uh, Professor John Cerrone um, with the Human Rights Academy. I'm now with Washington College of Law. I have a question for Viviana and for Professor Cerrone um, about witness protection um, for those uh, people that have come to the United States or other countries and got asylum. Um, but are asked to testify um, in cases going on um, that Venezuela has opened up perhaps to ward off, you know, the ICC um, opening or have being able to open some additional <laughs> um, cases. So I, I don't know uh, what you could say about that, but um, if you could just speak to witness protection of people that have to come back and then retaliation of family members that could not leave. Um, Venezuela um, when they're testifying, and also the lack of um, credibility of any of this evidence um, because I don't know how you can testify accurately when you, you need to protect the people that are still going through. It's still a fragile state, so any type of investigation at this point, I don't know what you're going to do with that evidence. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those questions. Uh, we got um, multiple questions there, so I, I think that um, we'll confine to this round. Um, I'll ask the speakers to respond in the order that they made their presentations. We have a 
little under 15 minutes. Um, so if you people could keep um, each of your responses to four or five minutes. So please, let's start with Carlos. Um, I'll begin with the last question um, about the lack of response by the international community. Why? Well, I would say that I would identify, first of all, a lack of timely response, because nowadays we see a lot of uh, responses coming from everywhere, from the European Union, from the Group of Lima, from uh, even Japan, I mean, countries around the world. Uh, I think there was a consensus at the OES that uh, the collective response or protection of democracy was mainly focusing the traditional military coup d'etat, the traditional uh, dictatorship by the military. And certainly that was over. The, the, the 21st century dictatorships are elected dictatorships of the Fujimori regime. Uh, I think in part of, uh, due to the econo economic strength of uh, the government of Venezuela at that time, I think that the uh, revenues uh, from the oil uh, exports to Venezuela, plus the foreign uh, debt acquired, especially from China, the, the amount of the foreign debt with China accounts almost for 40 billion of dollars, which is higher than the rest of the Latin American countries' debt to China combined, so you can figured out the amount of this uh, economic uh, relationship. Uh, I think the Venezuelan government used the tool uh, at its time of a charismatic leadership, uh, the, the popular support that certainly Chavez had inside and he, he, he didn't need to steal, openly steal elections at the time, he had the popular support and uh, it was more I would say, uh, gray situations at the beginning. Uh, for us, probably for constitutional uh, scholars will be a clear cut situation, but some of them were gray situations. So he, he used, in my opinion, that um, economic tool, that leadership tool to create uh, UNASUR, to create uh, the ALBA group and to have some kind of influence in Europe, opening somehow for some investments in the oil sector uh, for the Europeans. So I think that the early warnings raised by the human rights parties at the time, early, very early, 2002, 2003, with the first reports, um, the first cases of judges being dismissed arbitrarily, so on and so forth, were not heard by the political bodies due to this situation, this political situation. Um, I'm sure, and I'm, 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 I'm certain to say that the former OES Secretary General didn't help at all, didn't help at all the, the Venezuelan situation to be air uh, in the political bodies, which makes a big difference with the current Secretary General. Uh, but I think that when money, when Venezuela ran out of money and um, Chavez began its decline, then he died, the situation changed. Uh, and, 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 and I think that countries also, the, the political spectrum of some Latin American countries have changed, like in the, in the case of the blind support from uh, Argentina and Brazil. Uh, so. I would say that's, that's why we don't have the will, we still don't have the will in the inter-American system to defend democracy unless we're facing a traditional breakdown uh, through a military dictatorship. Uh, I, I would say that this will be, apart from the very old days of Fujimori, the first time that uh, the OES is reacting in a case of deterioration, uh, is sort of, uh, um, evolution in the wrong sense of the word towards uh, an autocratic regime. Um, 
Yes, no, I, I, I think the, the, the narrative is in part correct about, orga about organized crime and narco traffic in Venezuela, but it doesn't explain the whole picture. Uh, I think that you can explain the whole picture uh, through what's going on internally, uh, m closer to corruption, for instance. The amount of corruption in Venezuela is huge, is huger than the rest of Latin America combined. They just found $3 billion uh, in one bank in Andorra, finding who the owner is from the Venezuelan government officials. Uh, it's, it's a huge amount that they uh, stole the country, and now uh, the country is in, in its poor situation, and people is dying because of the lack of medicines, lack of food, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think it's a case uh, of organized crime by politicians with different um, sacks, different, uh, not only narco traffic, but also um, in the oil business, they have been uh, stealing the oil to do business and corruption abroad. Uh, so I, I would say that it is correct, but not only because of organized crime and narco traffic. It's, it goes well beyond and more comprehensive than that. Uh, and, I'm, and, and, and at the same time, I'm sorry to say that I feel that Venezuela has centered in the international geopolitics game. Uh, I, I think that the support of Russia, China, Iran is not a coincidence. I think that uh, Venezuela nowadays uh, is one point of discussion in international geopolitics. Uh, and and, and there, the Russians are openly supporting the regime, and I don't know in a change of what, when they want to discuss international geopolitics with the US. But it's certainly incredible uh, how you feel that we were brought into an international game that we were not part of. <laughs> Lastly, um, what can change the Venezuelan government? Well, that's, that's, that, that's the question, and that's, uh, that should be the, the answer. I, I, I think, very plainly saying, that a combination of international and national pressure on the government. You cannot have one without the other. Venezuelans are not able nowadays uh, to overcome this dictatorship, which is very uh, brutal and very powerful. And uh, Venezuelans are now suffering. People is not feeling in the mood of going out to protest or to, to you know, to walk or to manifest in public because they they don't feel like they 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 have seen their sons and daughters die being in prison. They have been brutally repressed, and they are uh, in hunger right now. So there has to be creative ways uh, to mobilize people, but there, the people has to be mobilized. Um, there is a question, what do the politicians should do uh, when facing a dictatorship? I was having a discussion uh, one day with the Secretary General, and I don't want to quote him, but he, he thought that in dictatorships, the politicians should go out of the country and organize, uh, and organize the, 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 the throne of the government from outside. Uh, and I have the feeling that if all the politicians leave Venezuela, uh, people will, will be left alone and uh, won't, won't have the, the leaders inside Venezuela to, to help them organize, to help them uh, overcome the situation. Um, so that's, that's my, my, my response to that question. Regarding the reaction of Maduro to yesterday's report, is disqualifying the report, that's coming from the Empire, where it was issued in this city, the, capital of the empire, and uh, as, as the response to the uh, prosecutor's statement, I have it here, a comunicado, uh, the prosecutor's statement when he, uh, she opened at the preliminary examination, they rejected. Uh, it, was, it, it, it is an arbitrary, it, 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 it has a lack of due process, so on and so forth. 
At the end, they said, well, we, we will cooperate. But, it, but the, the, the comunicado is rejecting the opening uh, as, as a biased decision, as a non-transparent procedure, and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank Great, you so thank you. Um, so we'll move to Viviana. Um, if you could very, very um, brief, and you don't have to respond to all of the questions. Yeah. develop legal frameworks and legal standards. Uh, in Argentina, through a friendly settlement of one of the cases that we litigated uh, that um, led to the passing of a new um, law that was more protective of the rights of, uh, of uh, uh, migrants in, in Argentina. Several of the cases that we litigated held evidence that the gross violations occurred in the context of mass deportations or arbitrary deportations and lack of frameworks of protection, including cases in the Dominican Republic and, and securing the right to education of children. Um, in, in the case of um, the Dominican Republic and in a, in a very early case in, in Venezuela. Um, in terms of the question that was uh, asked by our colleague in the Atlantic Council on the Cartagena Declaration, we can on and, and, and talk a bit more about that. And here are some of my colleagues from Cecil that are experts on the issue. But the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has a position that was um, very clear in uh, its uh, resolution on forced migration in Venezuela that talks about its understanding of the scope of international protection uh, that is, is broader than the, the understanding of the UN um, instruments and how it should uh, encompass the situations that are, are highlighted in the Cartagena Declaration, and I have it right here on my phone, so I can it, or if you don't have it in it yet. And in terms of witness protection to people that have to um, testify in Venezuela, and I'm not sure whether I'm understanding this correctly, I think that with the collapse of the rule of law and um, the limitations of the guarantees of, of rights of, of people. I think that there are very little possibilities of uh, ensuring the adequate protections of those that cooperate with the legal system. Thank you. OK, super briefly. Um, best guess on a timeline. Again, it depends on cooperation. I think the Venezuelan government will probably adopt a public posture of defiance while discreetly cooperating with the court. It may not be good faith cooperation, but it'll be cooperation enough to stave off an investigation, because obviously it would be bad for the ICC to open an investigation. And then the possibility of issuing arrest warrants would be majorly cramping the style of Venezuelan government officials. Um, on the question of lack of independence of the judiciary being to demonstrate inability to prosecute genuinely, certainly that's theoretically possible in practice, I think highly unlikely because it's such a hazardous undertaking for an international official to opine on the degree of independence of a national judiciary. Um, Naomi, on where to go in, in the situation of the corrupt government narrative, the criminal gang narrative, and I and I, I I agree that to the extent this is seen as something driven by greed and having collateral damage that's causing human suffering, that leads us away from the narrative of crimes against humanity because again, it's all about intentionality. So if it's callousness towards human suffering, that's not enough. There needs to be a policy to inflict human suffering if we're talking about a crime against humanity. Uh, food scarcity, the possibility of using that as a crime against humanity, again, it's intentionality. You would have to be able to show this was being done intentionally to launch an attack against a civilian population. Again, if it's inadvertent, if it's a consequence of some, even if it's a bad motivation like personal greed, that's not gonna be sufficient to qualify it as criminal behavior within the Rome Statute and a crime against humanity in particular. And in terms of witness protection, certainly the, that's a priority issue for the ICC, but as with everything else, the ICC is dependent on state cooperation. So it really depends on the extent to which states are willing to step up and provide that protection. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Carlos Ayala. Thank, thank you, Viviana Kusasevitz and John Cerrone. Thank you very much. Excellent.